So, Satya, it's a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you very much for making the visit and taking the time. As Stefan said, these are all mostly software developers or people involved in the development of our products. And since you have been on tour now, I know they're all very curious to hear what you think about our products. So how did you like it? You know, first of all, thank you so much uh, for ha coming uh, or ha having me come and uh, visit and take a tour. Uh, when I came in, I, you know, I thought, wow, this is a place where I'm going to learn a lot about uh, brain surgery. Uh, and I must say, you know, not only did I learn a lot about brain surgery, but I learned about how technology uh, that we produce can, in fact, be used by more, you know, ingenious people uh, on really changing people's lives. And I think to really talk about and see in action digital technology being used in a variety of different fields is perhaps one of the most exciting things for me in my job, and this morning was no different. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we talked when we were walking. In 30 years, we have been developing medical software in the, in the digital field. Leaving the Commodore times away, <laughs> it was basically 99% on Microsoft technology. And when we followed your technology in the early days, getting the Microsoft Developer Network stack of CDs every month, um, Microsoft always had initiatives in the area of healthcare. Um, and specifically in the recent years with the Inner Eye Project and Health Next, it seems that there's actually even more activity. So would you mind explaining us um, what your strategy in healthcare is? Yeah, first of all, it was so awesome to see uh, how you took the Commodore 64 and put a beautiful casing on it and called it uh, Brainwave or what have you. And it's an <laughs> it's, uh, it's awesome way to sort of go about uh, thinking about how app technologies evolve. See, when I look um, at what we are trying to get done, um, the fundamental thing that is really happening is we need more computational power as more things are getting digitized. Mm -hmm. uh, the most secular thing that's happening, uh, whether it's uh, in surgery or in hospitals or in industrial settings or anything else, the idea that you can digitize what you want to take action on and literally simulate everything before you take the action. And then even when you take the action, there's a digital exhaust that comes back is what's happening. So in healthcare, we broadly look at all of the digital data and how do you relate all of that digital data and then on top of that, how do you reason on top of it? Uh, so for example, one of the projects which obviously uh, would have a relationship to what you're doing uh, at scale is something called InnerEye. It came out of our Cambridge lab. And the idea was, how do you really help somebody uh, make sense of actual tumors uh, by just feeding uh, a lot of images? In other words, how do you take computer vision uh, and start cracking not just autonomous driving, but all these other domain challenges uh, across industries. So that's kind of really the approach we're taking, whether it's on genomics or now even on the immunology side. Uh, as more and more data comes in, we come at it and say, horizontally, how can I apply a variety of AI techniques, uh, whether it's computer vision, whether it's natural language. I mean, one of the other things, even just last weekend, uh, you know, we came on tops on uh, an MRC or a machine reading comprehension uh, test that I guess happens at Stanford. Uh, and that's all about being able to even take the notes that come out of all of the doctors and clinicians uh, and to be able to make sense of it and to relate it to imaging. So that multi-sensory sense of fusion is probably the next frontier for us. Uh, but we really are a horizontal technology platform company that's building the intelligent cloud, the intelligent edge, and the AI capability so that it can be applied uh, in healthcare and in other, uh, other vertical industries. So would you say all these initiatives in research um, are meant to be real research project, or will Microsoft at one day even be a competitor of us with real end products? Well, you can be assured of one thing. We will not be in brain surgery. Um, the idea that we have partnered uh, in providing technology platforms so that you can build the businesses that you build is really our strategy. Uh, we, in fact, are very principled about not crossing that domain boundary. Because if you think about what's happening in uh, the world around us, whether it's an automotive company or a healthcare company or an energy company, they're now digital companies. 
Uh, what is most important is for us to have a trusted relationship uh, with these partners where both sides are building digital platforms. Uh, so to me, what's most important is how can our research or development help you accelerate what you're trying to do in terms of changing health outcomes around the world. Uh, so we definitely think that what you're doing and what we're doing can be layered so that it can have more impact uh, versus us essentially trying to do more than what we are capable of doing, quite frankly, because with the expertise you have, whether it's the domain or even the digital technology, some of the things that you're doing, even taking the volumetric data and being able to, in fact, do AI on top of it, that's expertise that we want to enable maybe with some new techniques, uh, whether it's, it's on the visualization side or on the uh, platform side. But clearly what we want to be is a true platform provider. Very good. So how exactly could such a partnership look like? Like how could Microsoft support companies like us? I think the first thing we should do is we should be talk, take, going together to all of the hospitals that need more of the brain lab equipment and software uh, and making sure that every surgery room in the world uh, is really being powered uh, by you. And after all, every, pretty much every hospital in the world we will have some relationships. So I think the Microsoft uh, partnership could help significantly accelerate uh, your mission of really changing the health outcomes of people all around the world. Then when you look at the broader range of healthcare and new technologies, what technology, in your opinion, has the biggest impact to change healthcare in the next five years? You know, one of the things, um, coming from a country where close to, what, 18, 19% of our GDP is in healthcare, um, we have a real challenge ahead of us, which is we do need um, to really make sure that we are applying technology so that we can have better health outcomes and more efficient running of our healthcare system. So even just the administrative cost, like there's a lot of new technologies we'll talk about, just regular automation of the workflows uh, is super important. Somebody was telling me in the United States, for every doctor, there's nine administrators. Um, and so that's a real challenge uh, if that's what's happening. Uh, so therefore, I would say even the mundane part, uh, what somebody was describing what scheduling in healthcare looks like. So somebody who is sort of goes in uh, to the reception and wants to be able to schedule multiple doctors to see them, that's a challenge uh, which is still unsolved, which is unbelievable, but it is the case. And so we need to get much better at being able to automate the workflows that make the administrative costs come down. After that, we get into the exciting space. When I come you know, to one of the surgery rooms and what you're already doing and seeing something like the HoloLens being used, in addition to all of the other cameras uh, that you already have put in to simulate what happens, I think mixed reality is going to be transformative because it's a medium where for the first time in front of your eyes, you have both uh, the real world and the virtual world. Um, and as we improve the field of view there, uh, I think that it can be very transformative, not only in surgery, but in every walk of life. Uh, I'm also very excited about AI and AI techniques, uh, even in the precision with which the surgery can happen, uh, or the exact models that get deployed even in the, ro in, in the robots that are there uh, on the operating table. Uh, so I think the AI uh, in general is another area that we are very, very excited about. Uh, one of the things that, uh, re in talking about healthcare and AI, uh, I'm very, very uh, ha you know, uh, bullish on what AI techniques can do to empower people with disabilities, for example. So one of the new applications we launched recently is something called Seeing AI that's available on, uh, in the App Store that allows anyone with visual impairment to be able to essentially use the latest technology from computer vision or the latest techniques of computer vision to be able to interpret the real world. Uh, uh, and even learning tools. So in Word, in OneNote, we have any, the ability for anyone with dyslexia to be able to read. Uh, one of the new techniques we have you know, in uh, Windows 10 is eye gaze. So just, some, just imagine a patient with ALS uh, being able to type with just their uh, gaze. Uh, so I'm very, very excited about what AI can even do in terms of just the input-output mechanism and empower more people. And then the last thing is just the computational power uh, that the cloud and edge can provide because 
One thing we can be sure of, given all of the software programmers here, is you need more computing power uh, in order to be able to run the algorithms you want, to be able to reason over larger and larger amounts of data. Uh, not just in the cloud, but even in the edge. For example, the thing that was striking to me is the amount of uh, data that's being generated, uh, whether it's the cameras, whether it's the other sensors. Uh, you're not going to be able to rendezvous all of that uh, in the cloud. You want to be able to, in fact, run uh, local compute and local AI models. Um, and so to me, having a new form of distributed computing, which is more event-driven uh, and uh, more capable of taking advantage of both the edge and the cloud, I think is the future. Yeah, thank you. Obviously, there is an endless need for computing power, and as soon as you have more power, you have more ideas of what to do with it, and you need it ground- It's good to be in our industry. <laughs> yeah. And you need it ground-based and cloud-based. That's right. But it seems uh, for, for many applications, the cloud is the only way to go if you want to share a massive amount of computing power, like for artificial intelligence for multiple end customers. At the same time, you're running into all these discussions specifically in Europe and specifically in hospitals when it comes to data privacy. And sometimes the fact that many computers are not even connected to the internet at all. So how is Microsoft tackling that problem, which seems to get bigger and not smaller? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a good point because there is, as the needs for more computation are growing, so is rightfully so uh, more concern of what a connected world would mean, whether it's on privacy or whether it's on security or legitimate reasons why people may want digital sovereignty. Uh, the way, at least the approach we have taken is to be very uh, grounded in the real world needs. Uh, so take something like digital sovereignty. In, in Germany, for example, we run a German cloud uh, with even a German trustee. Uh, just to ensure that there is uh, real assurance uh, of privacy and security. Uh, of course, with GDPR coming, our cloud is going to be day one uh, compliant. In fact, if you are on our cloud, you can essentially benefit from all of the controls that we have uh, you know, worked on uh, to be able to inherit that uh, from a GDR, GDPR compliance perspective. Um, also, for example, if you want to go to China and operate in China, we are one of the f few, only North American or only Western uh, cloud provider that operates in China under Chinese law. Uh, so the idea that you actually respect the various regulatory regimes, various digital sovereignty needs, and have coverage is in fact going to help more businesses really use the cloud to get into more countries. So that's kind of the fundamental thing. The other side of it is, I believe, um, we have to just get smart about how encryption is used. Uh, just because things are in the cloud or on the edge doesn't mean uh, you can't be in control of what state the data is, whether it's at rest or in flight. Uh, so we have really worked on tremendous amount of key management control. Uh, so that application developers can really literally you know, decide what data is where and what control and what encryption you have. So I think that uh, we will have to overcome some of these barriers uh, that people have had around cloud adoption because that's the only way forward to have the elastic compute and storage capacity, but at the same time support all of the regulatory and, uh, and sovereignty needs that customers are going to have. So since we're having so many developers here, obviously they also received many requests on questions regarding software development in general. So over the last 30 years, the way how software development works in general has changed drastically. While 30 years ago, basically you could know almost everything. Today, you really have to make your choice on languages, frameworks, platforms, etc. Us being developing in the Microsoft environment, of course, uh, we're very interested to hear from you um, what changes a future development framework might be. Um, and even if uh, you have a, a take on what future programming languages might be. So what's next after C Sharp, for example? <laughs> you know, the, uh, it's, it's interesting. Starting up on languages, uh, since after all, you know, Microsoft was uh, f uh, started when Bill um, like your founder dropped out of college um, uh, to create a basic interpreter um, uh, for the Altair. Uh, 
Um, and so we are very, very fond of our languages and we are very, very fond of language development. Uh, I personally think uh, that uh, functional languages like F sharp are really, really uh, where you know, program correctness is so good. Uh, your ability to be able to uh, really reason over your code uh, is fantastic. Uh, so I'm excited about F sharp. Uh, but one of the places where uh, we're going though, which is the most challenging piece, is take the interpretability of a deep neural net. Uh, we're, since we're talking about uh, brain and brain function, the, a deep DN, a, a DNN and how uh, it comes to its conclusions is one of the unsolved problems. Uh, and so for us, the cutting edge would be what is the set of frameworks uh, and test tools that allow us to be able to actually trace back uh, the decision making inside of even something like a DNN that exhibits something like transfer learning uh, is probably what we will have to go crack. Uh, so a lot of our languages people uh, are working on things like, hey, what is the statistical properties of uh, languages? How do you program uncertainty? Uh, those are constructs that are coming, I think, in a lot of what we're going to be sort of uh, experimenting with. So what advice would you have for, uh, let's say, an experienced software developer on what to focus on and maybe even somebody who's just making the decision, going to university, starting programming, um, they have to make a decision basically where to start. So what would be your advice or your recommendation? You know, to me, um, the thing that I've come to realize is the ability to see the big picture um, and yet be into the details is what software engineering is. Because if you look at it, the systems problem, I mean, if you look at some of what we have today, the ability to deal with large systems is, is becoming even more important as the world becomes more complex uh, and as you need to be able to deploy your advances in what is essentially a more complex world, your ability to understand uh, the system in its entirety uh, becomes important. So that's why when I look back, my operating system class or my networking class, which were the big picture classes, uh, were the most impactful. Uh, you know, data structures is awesome, uh, but if you don't think about exactly how do these highly distributed systems work, with just simple protocols. Uh, I think that it becomes sort of very, very hard uh, to sort of understand how what you produce gets deployed in the world. So I still think that being able to think about systems problems uh, and yet understand them from first principles uh, is perhaps the most important skill. Uh, we sometimes emphasize, wow, who is the most prolific coder on one particular algorithm? Of course it's needed. Uh, but it's the understanding of the entire system and how it works uh, is perhaps one of the things that uh, we underemphasize, but it's probably most important. It's great to hear how uh, passionate you are still about software engineering and software development. So do you still find time yourself to code? <laughs> you know, now I find uh, time to develop, you know, uh, look at code through my daughter's eyes. She's in 10th grade. Uh, and in fact, just yesterday, I guess, uh, she was showing me something she wrote on uh, some vector math in 10th grade. And I was thinking, wow, I don't understand this. Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the thing that I do look, one of the things that's sort of most fascinating is code behind. Uh, I tell you, JavaScript, thank God for that, which is in the browser, you can keep looking at it. Uh, so I now get a lot of enjoyment by looking at code behind uh, and reading code. Satya, thank you so much. That no. was a very interesting chat. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me and giving me the pleasure to be here and see all the great work you're doing. And congratulations. Uh, to all of you for really not only doing what you're doing in terms of just great software, but for really the impact you're having around the world given what you do. Thank you. Thank you very much.